good, good. Anyway, welcome everyone. I'm Britton Trice with Garden to Figure Out. And you have to bear with me as this is my first, uh, first time moderating via a Zoom meeting. Uh, but just participated in a bunch of them, but first time moderating, so bear with me. Uh, I want to welcome our guests today, Jessica Harris and Lois uh, Dry. Uh, we're here to celebrate Jessica's new book, Vintage Postcards from the African World. And we have lots of questions about this, you know, it's a fa fascinating book and, and story uh, about how Jessica got started collecting these postcards. And I uh, can't wait to hear the stories. Um, so I'm going to introduce Lolas, and he will in turn introduce Jessica. But it, in terms of um, if anybody has any questions as we get along, please just add them into the chat room and we will get to the questions. Um, and I think besides that, uh, we're going to start with uh, Lola's intro. So anyway, Lola's is uh, New Orleans born, Los Angeles based writer and filmmaker. Most recently joined the writing staff of the Amazon series, The Man in the High Castle. Before that, he wrote for the uh, Oprah Winfrey Network series, Greenleaf. And uh, of course, everybody I think here in New Orleans at least knows him for his work on Treme. And He's also worked with award-winning director Don Lodson, co-produced and wrote the PBS documentary Phobos Treme, the untold story of Black New Orleans. Lolas is a former columnist for the Times Picayune and also the author of Smokestack Lightning, Adventures in the Heart of Barbecue Country. And in addition to the book, he co-produced and wrote the documentary for the same, same title. Uh, he's a contributing writer to the Oxford American, and his work has appeared in many national magazines, including Gourmet, uh, Washington Post, New York Times, Bon Appetit, Downbeat, and the San Francisco Chronicle. So welcome, Lolas, and we look forward to uh, Thank you, Britton, and welcome to Kimberly and Caitlin. Good to see y'all. Um, I have known Jessica Harris now for 20 years. We met <laughs> in kindergarten. Um, what is most striking to me about Jessica is that I thought I had a lot of divergent interest. Jessica's depth of interest is broader than mine, and she also manages the difficult feat of having a depth of knowledge in a variety of fields. And so the more I talk to her, the more I'm like, oh, wait a minute, how did you know about that? How did you know so much about that? It may shock you that prior to meeting Dr. Harris, I had no idea there were people who collected postcards from strangers, from strange periods, from people in places with whom in which they had no particular personal connection. But when this book came out, I was excited to see the product of these labors and to also learn about the extent to which these labors can teach us about um, our own world and the world within it. So Dr. Harris, welcome. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. All right. Well, I'm gonna start off um, with my new vocabulary word, deltiologist. <laughs> you tell me what a deltiologist is and tell me how you became one. Well, I had no idea that I was one and I looked up what the word was for postcard collector and people who collect postcards are deltiologists. So I'm one of them. <laughs> and the thing that was so fun and so fine and so interesting about it was that it it came completely by accident. Um, some of you, I mean, Lois certainly who knows me, knows that I um, have a doctorate and my doctorate is actually on the French speaking theater of Senegal. Uh, and while I was working on my doctorate and writing the dissertation, I went to Senegal and there discovered a lovely old antique shop uh, but not an antique shop really in the French way or in the way that in New Orleans you might find on Royal Street or on Charter Street in the Quarter or even on Magazine Street, but in the sort of sense that it was in the, I guess, European section of the city, which they called then the Plateau. And it, but it was down a side street. It was really a kind of place that you wouldn't necessarily know unless you knew. And the girlfriend took me. And while I was there, um, we looked at this and that and the other. And then there was this little stack of postcards. 
and I flipped through them. They were quite pricey. I don't remember buying one then, but I remember being fascinated. At that point in time, there was also a book that came out in uh, Senegal that was views of old Senegal, and the views were all based on the postcards. So I, I was hooked. <laughs> I was just hooked by the way that they could show the past and the way that they could uh, let you know exactly what was going on. One thing that's striking to me is postcards are classified as ephemera, as things that are sort of here today, gone tomorrow, and not particularly lamented or missed. Yet you have found some lasting value in them. Give me some sense of why you find them of abiding significance and what they have taught you about our world, about the places where you travel. Well, I mean, I think that there are a lot of things that happen there. Um, First of all, I don't know that ephemera is all that ephemeral. I think <laughs> one of the things that happens with ephemera is that as you, as you look at it, as you see it, as you, as among other things, it ages, it gains value. As in, um, you know, a Chinese restaurant takeout menu may not be something you want. It's, you know, shoved up under the door, it's placed somewhere you don't want it. However, a Chinese restaurant takeout menu from 100 years ago then begins to tell you other things. It begins to tell you some, something about life then, something about the way people were, something about what people ate. Uh, at Queens College, where I taught for 50 years, they have some of the Chinese restaurant menus that Louis Armstrong con collected as he traveled and he annotated them. And so you never know what ephemera may be teaching you or may have the ability to teach you. So in that sense, um, uh, these things were fascinating because they taught me so much. Um, one of the things, um, somebody sort of said, um, what do you think of this in, in one phrase or sentence? And I sort of said, oh, it's easy. These are the faces of the ancestors. We don't necessarily see these faces because we may not have individual photos of great grandparents or great great grandparents. But these images here in general compass are, you know, somebody's grandma and great grandma and great great grandma and so on and so forth. And so for that, I think that they are valuable and informing in a lot of ways. Well, I tell you, um, whether you're speaking or writing, I think some of your best sentences are crafted about older things, things that you have a kind of nostalgia about. So if you could read page 20 from your book, I think it'd give our folks some sense of the beauty of the writing in this book. Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> um, so, I'm speaking about the cards and I'm talking about two different cards, one of which we'll see in a little while, I think. As I collected what I felt the card said, as much as what the card depicted was what drew me to postcards and directed my, my selection. In many cases, the cards unspoken yet very real dialogue with me as the viewer was is what directed the selection of one card over another. Some cards intrigue because of their inscrutability. Certainly when I saw the card Bashful Billy and his sister, as with Southern Dinner Toter, I was taken by the charm of the card itself. But of course, then came the questions. Were the children street vendors? Were they models who posed for the photographer? What was in the baskets that they carried? Who were their parents? Who did they grow up to be? Where did they live? Why were they photographed at the turn of the 20th century? What was the photographer attempting to portray? Each card brought its own set of queries. Uh, well, with that, Britton, if you could cue up Bashful Billy and his sister. Um, 
and there they are. So as you can see, these are interesting shots. It's an old card. I'm not sure exactly when it was printed, but it was printed certainly in the early era of cards. Um, I am going to see if I can find out whether or not it had a, um, a postmark. Because in some cases, that's the only way you can date the cards. Mm -hmm. The cards don't always necessarily have a time frame. And in some cases, cards were reissued so that you may think of it as X and then realize what you really have is Y. But with Bashful Billy and his sister, um, we don't necessarily know when, when they came to us. I know it was before 1904, I think. Uh, the card was actually copywritten in 1902. So it means it's over 100 years old. But if you look at them, they are obviously African-American children, but they are presented with a naturalness that is not necessarily always the case with American postcards. It's more perhaps and sometimes the case with European postcards. American postcards of that period tend to be satirical, which is a kind way of saying it, or just plain racist, which is another way of saying it, or difficult, difficult to look at, difficult to acquire. But these two children are just children. If you look, she's, uh, she's got her dress on, She's kind of cute. He's got his little finger over his mouth. They've got baskets and you don't really know. They're reasonably well dressed. Mm. They don't seem to be in ragged clothing or uncared for. Uh, she's got, and the coloring is, per, is not, per, was perhaps added later. The shot was undoubtedly taken in black and white and then the coloring was added. So these may not be the actual colors of their clothing. But what we see is that there was a sincere attempt to make them dressed, well-dressed, let's just put it that way. I mean, then if you look at the baskets, there's some kinds of greens in the baskets, whether they are um, salad greens or you know, maybe radishes turned down or something like that. There are definitely greens in the basket. And so, as you see this, you wonder, first of all, they've both got the same kinds of greens. Are they street vendors? Are they the descendants of those, those green sass men who used to sell vegetables on the streets of New Orleans about whom Lafcadio O'Hearn writes? Mm -hmm. What are we talking about in that case? And I'm not sure. I think we've moved on with postcards. We might. Yeah. Britain, I was uh, going to stay there for a minute yeah, and then go to. I will get back to where we were. Oops. Well, I tell you, might be a good time to move to Pig Vendor. And I'll confess, one of the reasons I suggested we use this picture is because when I was in Vietnam with our friend Gideon, Jessica, Mm -hmm. He got a picture of a family on a motorcycle with a pig strapped to the back. I heard the pig. <laughs> yeah, so I said, this had resonance, for, had international resonance for me. Exactly. And of course, you work in barbecue, so it was a right. pig, too. So right. let's talk about the, the real, real, real. Um, what is that? Yeah. But I think that with, with the whole thing, there's so much about that. First of all, it's going to sell the pig. So this pig, you know, this pig has got short shrift if he's still alive, and I'm not sure he is. Um, but it is also one of those black pigs, if you look. This is one of those black sort of feral pigs that um, that used to be all over the Caribbean, but they've put bounties on them, and so they've had all kinds of questions and problems with them. I think we've got some in Louisiana and they were destroying the levees some places. So we got some bounties on them too. 
but these kinds of pigs make for very good eating. <laughs> and so, um, so he's obviously taking the pig to market. I believe it is a Jamaican postcard. Mm -hmm. And so you're dealing then again also with the whole history of, um, of food, of eating, of pig eating in Jamaica. And that brings you to jerk pork. Mm -hmm. And when you start to think about jerk pork, you've got all of those things that come together in Jamaica to create jerk pork. First of all, you've got those black pigs, particularly, that are very resistant, that are around. Um, then you've also got, um, you've got other things like you've got the, um, the, let's see, the Maroons. The Maroons were the Cimarron. They were the mm -hmm. people who had been enslaved under the Spaniards. Jamaica was Spanish before it was British. And when the British arrived, those who had been enslaved by the Spaniards headed to the hills. The hills in Jamaica are not only hills, they're really mountains. They headed up into the Blue Mountains, into what's called cockpit country. And in cockpit country, they settled, they established themselves, they began to have their own culture. Now, the majority or a large number of the Africans who were enslaved and taken to Jamaica are Fante people. They are the Fante, the Ashanti, and the Denkera. And so they have customs of kingship. They have customs of matriarchy. They have all of those sorts of things. So when they settled in the hills, they reestablished themselves in those hills and as such created their own communities. There was a Western community and an Eastern community. Um, the community to the East would come down out of the hills and they came down out of the hills in Port Antonio around an area called Boston Bay. <laughs> now, Boston Bay was interesting because it was also a place where some of the buccaneers would come ashore. If you think of the word buccaneer, it really comes from the French term boucanier, and they were called buccaneers because they were boucanier. They would make boucan, boucan being a way of preserving meat. And so with the buccaneers and the preserving of the meat, um, that came together in Boston Bay with the whole um, maroon tradition. And voila, you get jerked pork in a number of ways. Zora Neale Hurston interestingly writes about it in one of her anthropological pieces, and I'm going to call it Tell My Horse, but I'm not sure that's the one it is. But she actually goes up into cockpit country and watches the pit roasting of the pork. And in true Zora Neale Hurston fashion, at some point she crows, I'm the only woman who's ever seen this because this is food for men. It is actually the war food of the maroon. Mm -hmm. They would jerk the pig, you know, dismember it, take it, you know, keep it. And then they could keep it while they were at war against the British. Now that brings one last apostrophe about Mr. Pig and the British, which is the maroon wars with the British were never lost or won they were settled by treaty. And the treaty, to the best of my knowledge, is still in effect today. <laughs> so don't mess with the maroons. And when the pig goes to market, think of all of those things. Mm. Well, I want to move on to something that will be familiar to we New Orleanians. Britain, can we go on to a uh, praline vendor? We can. I had a quick question for I'm Jessica, sorry. though. Sure. Jessica, when did you, when did you uh, have the opportunity to eat wild boar or wild pig? Um, in Jamaica, eons ago, probably, or in Haiti. They are all over the Caribbean. And, uh, but at some point, uh, people in the Caribbean were told, this is not good for you, it's bad. And so they brought in the pigs that are, we are more familiar with, which of course died out. And so, you know. <laughs> There's, there's right. a big story there. <laughs> okay. And I may not be telling it correctly, but that's the way I remember it. So, <laughs> but there we are. Uh, this lovely lady, 
is another early card. You can tell it's an early card because with the early cards, there was no space on the back to write. The back was only for the address. So any message that you had to write was written on the front of the card until they came to a period which was called the divided back period. And that's one of the ways that cards are dated because when you find cards with a divided back, they are later cards. The earlier cards just had one spot on the back and it was for the address. Um, we have a glorious Pauline seller and she's got all of the accoutrements she's got on her tignon. She has uh, her, um, her fan so she can keep the flies away. Okay, because it was candy and it was probably hot and it was sticky. So she's got the fan to keep the flies away. She is dressed with her apron, you know, the sign of being a cook. So she has made those herself more than likely. And the, um, the shawl, which is actually a remnant of the classical um, dress from Martinique and Guadeloupe, they would wear a shawl very much like that and clothes like that over a grand robe, so a grand robe créole. Mm -hmm. um, let's now go to Nutcake Cellar, Britain. And I suggested these two paired because they're similar but also very different. Well, here we have a nut cake vendor. This is not New Orleans. Mm -hmm. This is Charleston, South Carolina. And she's selling a nut cake. This though was, if you look at the background, this was probably posed in a studio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not taken in situ. I think the New Orleans one, and I'm not gonna ask you to toggle back and forth, but the New Orleans one looks as though it was more taken in situ. But remember that, old photography was such that these were long exposures. These were not, you know, these were not selfies. These were things that took a while. But if you look, she's got a variant on the same thing. She's got the nut cakes and you can see them clearly in her lap. She's got her fan. Um, but she is not as well dressed, if you will as the other lady, the other vendor. She has what looks to be a burlap sack over her lap, protecting her clothing from, from perhaps the drip of the sugar or whatever else, the stickiness, what have you. She has this lovely little sort of bent, beat up hat on that's definitely got character. And she has what seems to be a blanket or something tied around her and pinned. I can't see what the pin is, but pinned to, you know, pinned to keep it closed. But it's two very different versions of a similar culinary tradition. So we've got the praline cellar, we've got the nut cake vendor. If there were time in the book, there's also a candy vendor from uh, Guadeloupe who's selling very much the same candy. So if you look, you begin to also see through these cards a way that you can trace culinary arcs. This is a candy that goes from probably nut cake might be peanuts to the pecans in the pralines to perhaps peanuts back again in the Caribbean. So you've got all of these other ways of dealing with things. There are some that are actually made with Brazil nuts in, um, in Brazil that are called pé de moleque, little boy's foot. So mm -hmm. you've got this whole arc of this praline kind of candy that goes throughout. Uh, let's move to oyster cellar. And of course, this is not a way we're used to seeing oysters sold on the street, although it's parallel to what we see in, in restaurants. Well, I don't know that he's on the street. I don't think we've got him actually yet, but we'll get him in a minute. But what's interesting is he is, he, the card, there we are. The card says Norfolk natives, Norfolk, Virginia. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it's interesting and interestingly problematic that the man is equated with the oysters. They're both Norfolk natives. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look, just look at the size of those oysters. Those oysters are ginormous. Okay, I don't see oysters that size. I'm actually allergic to them, but I sit with people who eat them and I haven't seen anybody eating an oyster that size. Um, but also, if you look at him, he seems to have on some variant of a chef's jacket. I don't think he's a street vendor. I think he is someone who was selling in a shop or a restaurant who was just asked, to hold this up or to step outside and hold these up. If you look at the bottom of his outfit, you can see that he's got an apron on. He's got the chef's jacket. It seems to be stained in some way. Now that could be oyster juice, that could be any kind of detritus. But I think he's one of those people um, who made his living, perhaps, if you look at his smile, he's got a little twinkle going. He might have been shucking and jiving. Mm -hmm. And you all know that expression. I believe it is a New Orleanian expression in its origin because oyster shuckers used to make tips. And how did they get their tips? Well, if you talked a little jive, you might get a better tip. So shucking and jiving was just that. You got to shuck, you got to jive a little, and hopefully you made better money. So we've got this oyster seller who is also talking about the degree of involvement that African-American men particularly had with oystering in the United States. Now, I don't know, perhaps people think of Norfolk and connect it with oysters today. I don't. But the Virginia area, the Maryland area particularly, and of course, New Orleans, the Gulf, oyster heaven. And the oyster men were overwhelmingly, certainly in the mid-Atlantic states, overwhelmingly African-American. Oyster culture was something at which people excelled to the point that there was a gentleman named Thomas Downey who got to New York, came to New York, and opened, well, first of all, seeded his own oyster beds off Staten Island, began his own oyster culture, um, then gradually from selling them on the street, moved and morphed and ended up with uh, oyster cellars where he could keep them, you know, keep them wet, keep them damp, all the things oysters require, then ended up with an oyster refectory that became so famous and so renowned that um, Charles Dickens ate at Downing's Oyster Refectory. Um, he would heat the oysters and plop a dollop of butter on them. And it sounds a little like some things we might know in New Orleans, and that's kind of what, what Downing did. Downing was so, so famous that he actually shipped oysters. I'm not quite sure how, but he shipped oysters to Queen Victoria. Hmm. Well, let's move to the lady cooking in New Orleans. Get back home for a minute. Well, you she know, was cooking at, I think it's, what is it, 820? I can't read it, but... She's cooking on St. Louis Street, and it says Courtyard Kitchen. Can you read the date or the address? 820. 820. Yeah. Anybody look up the address? <laughs> no. It's the Herman Dreamer House. Ah. <laughs> it's an early iteration of a kitchen at the Herman Dreamer House before they did the, I don't know if it's before, but the kitchen in the house now is in the outbuilding, which might be the courtyard kitchen, but they've also discovered the potager 
and redone the potager there. So this is an early postcard of the Grima house. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's interesting, obviously, you know, stating the extremely obvious is the whole hearth cooking that's going on. Okay, the hearth cooking, the demonstrations, you've got the, the jack, you've got the pots over the hearth, you've got the kettle uh, in the front, you've got some, the andirons and of course the fire tools. And a backhanded acknowledgement, but an acknowledgement nonetheless, is the lady who's doing the cooking. Mm -hmm. She would have been the lady who's doing the cooking, again with the New Orleans variant of Creole dress, which is the tignon. You know, we've Maybe got all these hairnet hair rules nowadays. If you work in food service, you have to wear a hairnet. Well, you didn't have to wear a hairnet. You put your tignon on and your hair was covered and everything was sanitary and you were fine. But if you look, she's got the, the apron, she's got the, the foulard, the, the shawl, the scarf. She's got the, a variation on the same thing we saw with the prowling cellar. So all of that is... Now we're going to move to the last photo of our discussion, uh, the photo of the Amazonian women who are not in South America. Oh, wait a minute. I, I, I think we've got it. one more. Yeah. Yeah, we've got Indeed. one more before we get to the ladies. Well, let's talk about the male vegetable vendor. This is, a, this is just a beautiful picture, forgetting about its significance in terms of history and culture, but it's a nice picture. Yeah, and he is so relaxed. Uh, if you look closely, and some of you who are seeing this maybe for the first time are not necessarily distinguishing, but he has his, what in the Caribbean they call le tray, the tray, as opposed to the plateau, which would mean tray. A tray was something that vendors used. And so he's got that tray full of vegetables on his head atop his hat. Okay, but he is very sort of suave. If you look, he looks almost as though he's got a hand in his pocket and he's just comfortable, comfortable with this. This is the companion piece. There were actually two companion cards. There is the male vegetable sellers and there are female vegetable sellers, which we're not going to show. But he is so special because you don't always see men doing this kind of work. We're used to seeing women vegetable sellers with things on their heads. But a man with something on his head is unusual. And so that's one of the reasons that I got, got this card. If you look at the streets, you can see it's definitely Charleston, South Carolina. We've got that Charleston architecture. We've got the shuttered houses. Um, if we could look more closely, we'd probably be able to see that these are either Charleston singles or doubles with their own particular side entrance which is truly the Charleston architectural form. And now to our ladies of, uh, of the Amazon, or the African Amazon, shall we say. Well, Jessica, I know this one is very special to you. Why this is that? one is very, very special to me. I have actually a Xerox of it that I keep on my desk. And these ladies, this is an old card. This is a, um, you know, undivided back. Um, this is from the Fortier collection. If you look down at the bottom, it says Collection Générale Fortier Dakar. It's from Senegal, West Africa. Um, Monsieur Fortier, Mr. Fortier was an early ethnographer, if you will. And he traveled all over West Africa um, taking photographs many of which became postcards. His collection of, uh, of images is incredible. They have some, I think, at uh, Northwestern, and they have others at the Museum of A uh, African Art, Smithsonian Museum of African Art in DC. Um, these photographs are astonishing um, repositories, if you will, of culture of Western Africa. So. This is the AOF, Afrique Occidentale, Occidentale Francaise, French West Africa. Celles qui furent les Amazones, femmes guerrières redoutables. So these are those who were the Amazons, 
women warriors, um, redoutable, I'm not even sure how to translate, but frightening, scary, re, re, not redoubtable wouldn't be an English word, but um, those who are um, worthy adversaries. So here's the story of the Amazons, King Beonzin. Beonzin was the last king of Abome in the country that was then called Dahomey, that's now called Benin, had a cadre of fighting women. He had a women's fighting force. Um, referring to the ancient Greek Amazons, they were referred to certainly by the French as the Amazons. And they were his women warriors. They were his elite guard. Um, that's who you're looking at. What happened and how they found them to be the Amazons was that um, they were vanquished. Beonzin was vanquished and sent into exile. I believe he went into exile in the Caribbean. But after the battle, the French went to cut trophies and for trophies back then in uh, for many it was genitalia and so they went to cut trophies on these warriors they thought and it was like oh my lord it's women they were absolutely astounded astonished and terrified hence the redoutable and these were the remaining ones. These were the ones who survived the battle. These were the last of the Amazons. And so I just always say, look at their faces. Just look at their faces. Look at that indomitable spirit. Look at how they are unbowed, look at how absolutely amazing they are. And after you've done that for a minute, then look at what they're wearing. Look at the jewelry. Look at all of that. The lady at the back of the, or sort of in the mid-ground with the hat. Look at their hair. Look at, look at everything about them and just think, wow. Wow, those are the ancestors. Those are the ancestors of some of the kids who are on the streets marching today. Those are the ancestors, if you think about it in terms of New Orleans relationships, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall tells us that the early people in New Orleans were from Senegal and from Dahomey. Those are the ancestors. So those ancestors you may not know, you may not see the faces of, those are they. That's who those women are. And that's why I love, love, love that card. Mm. They certainly look well. well. Yeah. Um, I got a couple more questions, but I also wanted to give Britton or Kimberly a, a chance to ask a question if you'd like. Uh, either you have anything offhand or should I continue? I don't have anything offhand, but uh, I don't know if there's any, well, any questions in the chat room or not, but. Well, Jessica, one of the things that's striking uh, to me about your history in this regard is uh, a lot of this was kindled in France, but we don't live in France. What's the chance now of Americans traveling to American cities and finding similar treasures or being able to unearth these kinds of things? Well, there are postcards everywhere. There are plenty of postcards. One of the things that dawned on me as I was searching for postcards was, uh, you know, I looked at the postcards thinking, oh, point of origin. Postcards were designed to be sent home. And so even though they may have originated in Western Africa, they ended up in France because that was home to the people. Or they ended up, if they are British in England, or they ended up in Lisbon, or they ended up wherever they ended up. The United States is problematic. 
it's problematic for a variety of reasons. While in these cards, people are presented with relative dignity, in the United States, that was not always the case. In the United States, more frequently than elsewhere, and there's the question, you know, dignity within a colonial situation as opposed to, you know, dignity, capital D, may be different. But in the case of American postcards, they are often pejorative, demeaning, um, at some point just downright unpleasant. There were postcards made of lynchings that were sold as souvenirs um, that you can find. There were postcards, there's a whole series out of Florida of um, photographically, I hope photographically juxtaposed babies as alligator bait, African-American babies. Um, there are a lot of really disturbing American cards. So that finding American cards wasn't always the easiest task. Um, and and there, there are plenty out there. There is a section of the book, Bashful Billy is an American card. Um, the Prawling Ladies are American cards. Um, they're not all that, but more than elsewhere, the United States had a, a, a bias that was visible in its cards as well. I also wonder about the impact of mass production in terms of the ability to print a lot more cards a lot more cheaply than before. And also about the convenience of email and other communication methods. And have, is it your impression that we could not uh, that you know, 20, 30, 50 years from now, finding cards of this period will be less rewarding, or am I? Well, there are thinking? very few cards of this period because we're no longer doing that. I mean, you know, we take a selfie. I was on the, I don't know, I think I was reading the Washington Post earlier today, and the Louvre in Paris has opened up again, and so people are there with their masks taking selfies in front of the Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, Scroll back to my first trip to Paris, which was in the 60s, no selfies, but I bought a postcard of the Mona Lisa. Scroll back earlier than that, and there were not only no selfies, but no real fast communication, no telephone. So the thing that's interesting about postcards is in many ways they replaced telephones, they replay, or they predated telephones. Uh, some of the messages on some of the cards are simply, I'm arriving on Friday, pick me up. Because the card could get there and it was a way, it was a way of quick, fast communication for people. So that they did that as well. That was one of the primary reasons for cards. And then, they, then you got the wish you were here thing. But it was originally a, just a quick method of communication. They were cheaper than a letter. Uh, they didn't require as much effort or energy. You could pop it in the mail, which worked. And, um, you know, you could get it there. You could get it there rapidly. And so, you know, not necessarily coming to dinner tonight, but you could say, I'll be arriving in two weeks kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so that made them viable and useful and also a real means of communication as well as a way to perhaps preserve an image. And sometimes you find that there's this sort of disconnect even between the image on the front of the card and the message on the back or the message even on the front sometimes. It's if you go back to that one with the Prawling vendor, it says something to the effect of, say hello to mother or something like that, you know. Uh, what does she say? So that you see all of those things. It says, with love to you and your mother, you know. But mm -hmm. well, why, why choose a prawling center, seller? <laughs> you know, to send love to you and your mother. Sorry? Uh, where did you get 
uh, the majority of your collection, uh, I assume abroad, huh? A lot of them are French. I have a lot of French ones. I have, um, I found some in England. Uh, the first real kind of, oh my gosh, they've got postcards moment was in a market in Belgium, in Brussels, on a trip. Um, very few purchased in Africa, few purchased in the Caribbean. Um, I had a mother load, I'm on Martha's Vineyard right now, I had a mother load, well, decade back, more than a decade back, of old cards of Jamaica for 25 cents each, used bookstores, mm -hmm. because they often, you know, turn up that ephemera that turns up with used books. Right. Um, speaking of communication, Dr. Harris, do you send postcards these days when you travel? <laughs> no. <laughs> In words of one syllable, no. Um, I don't send postcards. I don't know that I ever really did send postcards. I think nowadays part of the problem with sending postcards is you've got so many email addresses, you may not know somebody's home address to send them a card even if you wanted to. Hmm. So there is all of that. Well, thank you for taking this time. This has been an education for me and yet another of your uh, excursions <laughs> into ephemera. There you go. Um, and you have a minute to talk about a next book because you always got something on doc. What is it now? Oh, I'm working on a cookbook, another cookbook that is going to be it's going to be a bit of a surprise. It's going to be about um, about American food and looking at, you know, another way of looking at American food. I'm not going to reveal too much because it's so far away. I don't want to give my idea away. But uh, it, it, it should be around. And then I'm working on an, a, actually a book proposal. I can talk about this one because nobody can do this but me. That's going to be about my father. Mm, okay, okay. Well, thank you for spending this time with us. Kimberly, good to see you. Ritten, thank good you. to see you. And there's Caitlin is on, and who else is on? Thank you, Caitlin and Karen and Doug, if you're still on. Uh, you got all these people who are not... Um... Are they not showing up for you? No, Anyhow. they're not remind people that okay, uh, yeah. we have Jessica's new book. So if anybody's interested, they can either order it online through us or uh, give us a call or an email and we're happy to, to get a copy out to you. And but, since uh, you can't go it. anywhere, you might as well stay <laughs> home and read books, right? Absolutely. Yep. And this is a fun one because you can it pick is. it up, just, look at two cards, put it down and come back to it later. Just many, many fascinating images. Yeah. Thanks for putting those together. Well, thank you. And I think that the University Press of Mississippi just did an extraordinary job. I'm really, it, it's, I don't say this a lot. I'm the lady with 10,000 books, but this is a pretty book. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank everybody for coming. Indeed. Y'all take thank care you. and stay safe. All take right. care, Likewise. stay safe, be well. Look forward to seeing you. And stay you that way. Okay. See you yeah. soon. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.